listening to Oilers Nation Radio, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts and delivered by DoorDash. One hour of straight hockey talk with Dan, Rick, Tyler, and Bag Milk starts now. Oilers Nation Radio episode 212. Bag Milk here. Nation Dan, Tyler, and Liam sitting in for Rick. I'm going to start off this week's podcast by telling you I'm very sweaty. It is 30 degrees in the capital city. A little bit muggy, a little bit humid, a little bit musky. But ultimately, it's for the best. Liam is pointing upward. He cannot hear. He needs the beat in his headphones. He's ra- raising the roof. He's pointing upward like a baseball player every time he hits a home run. Just like mm-hmm. I did yesterday in my kickball game. Ah. Oh, nice. Good for you. Thank you. In the park home run. Oh, wow. You're hustling too. Good for you. So that brings uh, up today's delicious debate about Liam's <laughs> Yeah, the delicious debate courtesy of our friends at Oodle Noodle. 17 locations and counting. They've even got one in Airdrie. Airdrie, Tyler. Hmm. Airdrie. If you're down there near Calgary, maybe you'll see Princey there. Huh? Who wouldn't want to see Mark Prince from Flame Station? Of course, if you're feeling lazy and you don't want to go out to Oodle Noodle, our friends at DoorDash will bring it right to you. Liam, live ding dong, please. Ding dong. Thank you. Uh, so there you go. Oodle Noodle, 17 locations and counting. If you want to get them on DoorDash, feel free to do so as well. Stay inside your house, especially if you have air conditioning. If not, go to Oodle Noodle. They have some in the store. Enjoy that there. Tyler, what is our delicious debate today? Delicious debate today. You know, there's no tampering in the NHL. You're not allowed to do that. You have to wait until tomorrow at noon Eastern to negotiate with a free agent. <laughs> with that being said, what do we think about five by five for Jack Campbell? So what if I think happens. is my, my first thought is that Cody Cece and Zach Hyman have been doing some GMing over the last couple of days since if I understand this correctly, they would not be tampering since they are not GMs. They're just reaching out to a friend to see how he would feel about a certain term and a certain number with a very specific hockey club. I see no problems with yeah. this. Liam? I think it's fine. Like you said, not the GM. So we'll take that for what it is. Uh, but on Campbell, I think for the options that were available for the Oilers, it's probably the best one, right? Yeah. Like even Kemper, I, is there much difference? Like we saw Kemper in the playoffs finish with a 902 in however many games. Like you could argue Mike Smith had a better playoffs, just take away the Stanley Cup, obviously, but like <laughs> Smith. Smith played pretty good too. And I think Cam- uh, Campbell's an upgrade over both of our goalies we had last year. So yeah, it's for me, like Kemper probably still would have been the the better option of the two. But with that being said, it sounds like Kemper might get five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars more per year and potentially an extra year on that deal. And he's two years older than Jack Campbell. So you go with the younger option. Granted, he's less proven, I suppose, um, but he's younger. He'll be a little bit cheaper. The term is a little bit less as well. And, you know, maybe there's a little bit of Cam Talbot esque upside here with a guy like Jack Campbell. You know, when the Oilers brought in Talbot. He had zero experience of being a number one goalie. Um, that guy came in and had you know a borderline Oilers record setting year in 2016, 2017, right? So I think there's reason to be optimistic about Campbell, but there's also reasons to be slightly concerned with it. Just considering, again, he hasn't hit the 150 game mark in his NHL career. Nation Dan, your thoughts on Yak Campbell? I believe it's a soft check. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Well, to to go to the tampering allegations first. I just want to say a huge shout out to the Toronto Maple Leafs for being like our money laundering franchise, but except they launder players for us and they sift out the good ones for us. And then we just pick them off of the top of the pile every year. So that's a huge ups to them. Um, Yeah. I'm still hoping for Connor Hellebuck, but uh, seems like that may happen though, Dan, I think outside, outside of that getting to shake and loose. We tried, we tried to shake that tree as much as we could. Uh, if that doesn't happen, yeah, I, I, I don't look at this as a being a as being anything less good than Mike Smith and and Miko Koskinen were last year. So uh, I expect I expect Stuart Skinner to to shoulder a, a heavier load. I think with Jack Campbell as as the one A option, but uh, I'm okay with that because I like what Stuart Skinner has brought to the team. For me, I think that Jack Campbell is an upda- upgrade on what we had, even with that. How long was that stretch, Liam? Like two months in the middle of the season? With with Koskinen? With uh, Jack Campbell in Toronto. Even with that, he started off hot, trailed off, 
picked it kind of back up towards the end of the season. He still finished the year with a 914 save percentage. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much right where you want your goalie to be, give or take. Obviously, it'd be nice if he bolstered that up. But I think this is an upgrade. I think that he's going to play more games. I think that, like Dan said, he's going to split it with Stuart Skinner. And I think... So I guess what the question is, is how do you guys feel about the tandem of... And this is how it goes. Of Campbell Skinner versus Smith Koskinen. Tyler? I think there's just a little bit more upside there with those two. I think Stuart Skinner is a guy who, you know, this organization likely has pegged as being a number one goalie of the future, or at least a guy who for the next 10 years can work in a 1A, 1B kind of tandem, right? Um, And I think with Campbell, again, we've seen him for stretches and fairly long stretches over the last year and a half with the Maple Leafs look like a legit number one, like a top 10 goalie in the NHL. And Mike Smith was great. Mike Smith had that upside as well. We saw how well he played down the stretch last season. But I also think there was a significant floor with Mike Smith, whereas with Campbell, I think that floor is a little bit higher. And then when you compare Skinner to Koskinen, you know, maybe the same floor exists there, although I'd argue Skinner's is also higher. But Skinner has a ceiling that Koskinen doesn't have. So I do just think the Oilers did a better job solidifying the position. It's not like they went out and got hella buck or anyone who's going to come in and play. 60. We tried though. Damn, did yeah. we try? It, they don't have anyone who's going to play 60 games for them next year. I think you're looking at like a 50, 30 kind of split. Um, but I think it's an improvement as a duo over what they had last year. Let me ask yeah. you guys a question then. Jack Campbell, if the insiders are right, and they probably are that he's going to be in Edmonton tomorrow. What do you make then of the Leafs going out and replacing Campbell with Matt Murray? <laughs> Ottawa retained 25%, send over a couple of draft picks as well for future considerations. What do you think? That's a big gamble to me by the Maple Leafs. Yeah, I mean, Matt Murray had a great season last year, a 255 goals against average and 918 save. Oh, wait, no, those were his American League numbers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> Let me pull up his NHL numbers. Uh, 305 goals against average, 906 save percentage. I think he went through a lot of stuff in Ottawa. And if this was a situation where the Leafs were signing him for a million or two, after he was bought out, I'd sit there and be like, yeah, that's a decent move. But putting your hopes of winning a cup on a guy who hasn't been good for two or three seasons and still costs you four point six five million dollars against the cap doesn't seem like the best bit of business, in my opinion. I, I think this is going to go one of two ways for the Leafs. It's either going to go poorly or it goes well for them. And we sign him in two years when he's a free agent. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is true. Yeah. <laughs> They got to they got to polish off the uh, the rough edges in Toronto before we take them. No debt, money laundering. You know, um, it's going to be interesting to see. Like I know everybody's talking about five by five for Jack Campbell, but what the actual final number is. And for me, I'm also really interested in the salary structure of that deal. With the Zach Hyman contract, a lot of it is bonus money. It makes a buyout not really possible down the road. That, that said, who's talking about that was Zach Hyman. He was amazing last year for the Oilers. But for Jack Campbell, this is a sizable gamble on a very important position within the organization. Do you care, Tyler or Liam or Dan, about the salary structure of this deal? Or are you just happy to have our man? I'm just happy to have a goalie. You know, like this has been what three years now of Holland trying to find a goaltender aside from Smith or Koskinen. Now you're finally out of the Koskinen deal. Smith's going on LTIR, and we got the second best goalie on the market. Yeah, I don't think it's like when you look at it from that way. I don't think you can really argue with what Holland's tried to do. He went out, got the one of the best players available this free agency, and that's got to be a win, right? Yeah, and I don't think he paid like an absurd amount either. Like if this deal was six by six, I'd be like, okay, let's uh, take it easy. Five by five seems fair. You would like it to be four by four or four by five or five by four, but it's free agency. You have to give a little bit more when when a player is a UFA. So five by five is fine. This is a guy who I think there's a decent shot of this thing working out. He's one of the best options on the market. Like, again, you have to remember the market in this conversation. Yes. Again, we'd love to have a stud number one goalie who's going to play 65 games. That wasn't out there to go get. So you had to go get the best out of what was available. And they did that. 
Yeah, I think that that's a really good point, Tyler. The the fact of the, of the market. The last time the Oilers waded into the free agent market, we ended up with Nikolai Habibulin. If you remember at the time, he was the best goalie on the market. I think that there's obviously a lot less question marks here with Jack Campbell than there was with Habibulin even at the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, for Oilers fans, you understand a little bit of trepidation just because it's not something that we've done in a long time. We haven't gone out and got a free agent goalie. We usually swipe and miss on those, and then we end up with Mike Smith as our goalie. So yeah. Uh, I mean, it's to me, it's a real positive. It's not Mike Smith. It's not Miko Koskinen. It's an it's a goalie that had a ton of promise in L.A. and Toronto was really high on him. And, you know, it even sounds like Toronto tried to circle back at the, in the 11th hour and missed out on it. And uh, if you believe the rumors that are floating yeah. around the Internet uh, to be true. And the case is, he said, ended up as an Edmonton Oiler. And I'm happy about that. The Leafs circled back to Campbell and he said, sorry, I just watched this great DVD the Oilers sent me. I'm <laughs> I'm sorry. Old. I can't wait to go to the mountains every weekend. <laughs> they send me pictures of the talus balls and they are beautiful. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if you'll like, how quickly will Jack Campbell be in town? Like, is it too obvious if like tomorrow at like one o'clock mountain time, they have a press conference and they're like, oh, he was just at the mall actually. So let's talk about that for a second because the tampering thing is funny. It's, but everybody's doing it. You know what I mean? Like Darcy Kemper is already de facto going to Washington. Well, how is that possible? I was actually thinking about that last night, Tyler. How funny would it be if the buzzer goes at what? 10 a.m.? Yeah. So 10 a.m. on Wednesday, July 13th. And then like 10.05, you see Jack Campbell sitting in Ken Holland's office signing a contract or something. That would be very funny to me. Yeah, very, I mean, you even look at the... Like you mentioned, we know Kemper... Or we kind of think, believe, wink, that Kemper is going to Washington. I mean... They traded both their goalies, and there's I was like, gonna say, yeah, come on. it's not like these organizations haven't tele telegraphed exactly <laughs> what's happening because of their own transactions. And also, with the Leafs, like, okay, you're telling me you went out and got Matt Murray. Why do you know that Jack Campbell's right? Like, everyone knows it's a it's an absolute charade. This whole like no talking, like tampering, blah blah blah. Um, it happens everywhere, so it's, it's not surprising. It's, it's the kayfabe of the NHL. It's it's when wrestlers are not supposed to be friends outside of wrestling with yeah. their with their actual friends. They have to hate the people that they hate in their storylines. It's Ooh, silly. Friends. Um, do you guys think that Ken Holland had a little bit more pressure on him this year because of what happened with Jacob Marks from a couple of years ago, where he tried to go get the best goalie available on the market, struck out, and now he had to do it kind of again. Well. It's hard for me to believe that he didn't make that transaction in last summer with Duncan Keith with this possibility in mind. It, like that has to have been something that they had discussed or, or thought was a possibility because why else do you make that transaction and, and not have that, that fail safe or that bailout if it didn't work out. So yeah, I, I don't know. I, I feel like, I feel like it's, yeah, it's, it's been kind of something that's been a backup plan for him, I hope. And, and we're seeing some of the fruits of that now. Uh, the delicious debate for our friends at Oodle Noodle and DoorDash. Dan brought up Duncan Keith. While we are recording this right now, Duncan Keith is in a suit. He is down at the arena. He's got his son there with him and he is retiring with from the NHL after a, what will be a hall of fame career. Um, I'm, if I'm being honest, I'm a little bit surprised he did this in Edmonton. Maybe I shouldn't have been. I don't know. Are you allowed in the hall of fame as an oiler? So, <laughs> well, of course he is a hall of everybody thinks that Duncan Keith is more. What are you allowed to go back to the other team and do it? Like, I don't know how it works. Once you fire I'm, your paperwork, who cares? Yeah, I yeah. suppose. Mm. I had I'm one quick sure. thing, sorry, just on the go Campbell ahead. thing. Okay, knowing Campbell's kind of history, I guess, of being injured and stuff like that, like how important do you think it, it should be for the Oilers this offseason to to find a good third string goalie? Like, and, I, and even with the depth of the organization right now, it's probably a good idea to have Olivier, Olivier Rodrigue and then probably a veteran goalie in the AHL this season. And then you can put Ryan Fancy in the East Coast. Like, I think that should yeah. actually be like a pretty key thing for the Oilers to look at in over this next couple of weeks. Kind of like they did a few years ago with Philip Forsberg or with Anton Forsberg. Yes, exactly. And then just don't wave him and then 
hopefully he doesn't become a star in the league. Too, <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. Like if you go out and sign Louis Deming, um, as, as an option, right? Yeah, like someone who, you know, off hero nearly, yeah. but like a guy who, you know, if you need him to come up and play in the NHL, yeah. like, you know, he's done it before and he can, and he's not going to embarrass himself, mm-hmm. but he can stay in the minors and back up and be a good mentor for Rodrigue. Yeah. Just like a couple of names, like Deming was one of them. I thought, I think he actually probably will get a backup position just seeing how he played. Yeah. Uh, J.F. Barube. Yeah, he's played a little bit over the last few years. Yeah, played. Tikarski, actually, that's a name Tukarski. I have time for. Malcolm Subban, do you think he, he'll probably get an NHL deal, though, I think? I don't think so. Michael Hutchinson, like, these are just random names. Yeah. The Staylock yep. return, perhaps, something to consider. Damn it, I'm in. For all you Staylock fans with the jerseys out there, I know yeah. you really want this one. Uh, Why well, you want to pull those out whenever you get you? Well, you have to change it now. New jerseys. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Jersey, it just look foolish if you bowled out the orange one. That would look <laughs> silly. I actually burnt mine already. I could, why would I keep them? You were yeah. so mad when he yes. got traded to the Barracuda. Uh, but yeah, they probably do need a third string goalie, but there's a long list of like boxes that Ken Holland needs to check in the next, you know, 24 hours to one week. Well, Duncan Keith's retiring right now. There's a, there's a box that needs to get checked today. Frank Saravalli reported via Twitter, Brett Kulak looking to, uh, test free agency could not come to an agreement just yet with the Oilers. That doesn't mean he's leaving for sure, for sure. But all of a sudden that left-hand side's looking pretty bare. If you're thinking about the Oilers to do list, well, this was in the mailbag yesterday. So I'm going to ask you guys, Oilers have a little bit of cap space now. How are you prioritizing the money? It seems like Jack Campbell is going to come to Edmonton as our new goalie. What's next? Well, so just to give people a general outline of how much money the Oilers could potentially have to spend, um, they have, you know, 6.3 that's going to go on LTIR and 15.8 in projected cap space right now. So if you take out the Campbell money and then add the LTIR money, you're going to have about $17 million to spend. You will have your goaltending duo locked up, although with Skinner on the books, that'll bring you down to closer to about 16 and a half million. Um, you have one, two, three, five D men on your roster if you count Philip Broberg, and you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven forwards signed on your roster as well. So you have 16 and a half million dollars, let's call it, to get your shopping done, per se. You need a couple of defensemen for sure. You need to take care of McLeod, Pugliarvi, and Yamamoto. The, the last two, Pugliarvi and Yamamoto, aren't exactly going to be the cheapest signings anymore, considering they have arbitration rights as well, and they're getting into their mid twenties. So it'll be uh, they don't exactly have like gobs of money. They can't go out and sign like two big name free agents or anything like that. They do need to spend it smart. Well, and it also seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Claude Giroux dream does not seem to be uh, in the cards as well, right? Yeah, it sounds like he wants to go to uh, Ottawa. That sounds or, you know, reading the tea leaves kind of thing like that's the most likely landing spot for uh, for a Claude Giroux, although nothing super official on that. So you never know. That feels like tampering to me. Yep. Tyler yep. is tampering. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As compensation for Giroux tampering with Ottawa, the Oilers must surrender a second round pick. That's there right. Go. Uh, what about we got to talk about Vander Kane. Uh, Kevin Weeks. I was actually surprised to see Kevin Weeks yesterday tweeted that the Oilers offered something pretty low on a three-year deal. According to Kevin Weeks, it was 4.75 by three years. Is Uncle Ken playing a little hardball here or is just the market for Kane not quite what we thought it was? I I think it's both. I think Evander Kane is learning that the market maybe isn't what he thought it would be. Uh, there's reports out there that he and his agent think he can get 48 to 50 million dollars on a long term deal, which would be like seven by seven. Right. Um, I think he's learning now he's not getting that. And the Oilers, according to Frank, were willing to be flexible and creative in their pursuit of, a, of Evander Kane talking about, you know, if you go settle with the Sharks We'll top you up to 21 million, right? Because that's how much he has potentially outstanding with San Jose. Three by seven, 21 mil. So I think the Oilers, according to reports, gave him a bit of a push of like, if you go settle for six million, we'll give you three years by 15 million to like- Three years by 15 million, wow. Three by five to get the 15 million to like bridge that gap, right? To make him whole. And it sounds like Evander Kane and his camp kind of went, sat there and went, no, 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 no. You're going to pay us market value and we're going to go get this grievance figured out with the NHL. And we're going to double dip a little bit. I'm going to get my money and then some. I'm going to have my cake and eat it too. And I think what Ken Holland kind of eventually said was, okay, you think you can get $49 million? You think you can double dip, win this grievance, I can get a contract? Have at her. Go talk to 
every other team in the league. Go talk to anyone in the world, Evander Kane and Dan Milstein. Go get it if you think you can get it. And I think Evander Kane might be learning that he's not going to get it. So where does that leave the others then? If Giroud is going to Ottawa or staying in the East, Kane may or may not be here. That's a You need somebody in your top six that can put some goals in the net. David Perron, anybody? I would love a round two of uh, who doesn't want a little DP from time to time. You know, he's a little bit of an older player can still put up points. He's gritty. He's a fucking annoying. Mm -hmm. And I would love to have him for a second tour of duty, depending on what that looked like. What do you guys think of a, a David Perron reunion? I, I really like the idea as well, actually. Like he's a big body. He's coming off a year where he was one of the, the blues most consistent scorers as well in the last two seasons he's played 113 games and he scored 46 goals in those games like this is a guy who can score you 30 goals a season and you know he's been putting up these numbers without a Connor mcdavid or a leon dry down the middle so i think you know a good veteran presence there'd be nothing wrong with signing david perron he's 34 years old it just has to be the right deal right like i'm not giving david perron five by five I'm giving David Perron two by six, two by five, something in that range, I think is reasonable, but I'm not going long-term with Perron. My thing I like the most about Perron is you look at his playoff stats. So he had 13, he had nine goals in 12 games this season, 13 wow. points, nine points, nine games last season before uh, St. Louis missed last season, the year before that. Uh, year before 16 and 26 when St. Louis won, and then he had nine and 15 with Vegas. Like he... He's contributing at the right time. He kind of reminds me of Hyman in that sense where he'll probably put up like 50 to 60 points for you. And then when the playoffs come around, like that's kind of his time to shine. And like, who doesn't want as many of those guys as you can get, right? And also David Perron has never scored more goals in a season than he did when he was here. And that was without Connor and Leon. So why not get the band back together? You know, it's also funny. Come on back. I'll, he had 90 penalty minutes that year and he's never had more than he had 60 once before that. And every other year he's like, he had 22, two years ago and he had 90 penalty minutes in Edmonton. He's a sassy boy, Dan. Well, I mean, I'll put the caveat out there first. I think that this year I'm going to be pivoting from screaming for a goaltender to screaming for left defenseman. I feel like that's our, our new kind of hole that we're going to have to fill throughout the season. Um, but yeah, when it comes to like a David Perron type, I'd love to see him come in. But again, like Tyler said, it just has to make sense money wise, but then you also have to sign Neil Yakupov. I say, of course. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we do. We'd be dumb not to, to be honest. Um, well, let's talk about defense because Keith out, um, and I'll, I've got some quotes here. Zach is transcribing the press conference that I'll read in a bit, but Keith out Kulak potentially gone. All of a sudden there's a big hole there. Any free agents that could potentially be of interest to the Oilers in free agency, Tyler or Liam. Um, for me, there's a few guys that I find interesting on the blue line. Nikita Zadorov is one with uh, the Calgary flames. who I think could be a really interesting target for the Oilers. He'd give them some size and toughness. I, I don't view him as a top four guy necessarily, but he averaged almost 17 minutes a game with the Calgary flames last season. A good enough option. I think think they're going to be priced out of some of the higher end names, Ben Chirot, John Klingberg, that kind of thing. Not necessarily realistic, um, but one hypothetical deal. If, if you can allow me to armchair GM for a second, I really like Colin Miller as a right shot option. Uh, he spent the last season with the Buffalo Sabres. He's not going to score. He's not going to put you up points, but he'll give you dependable minutes on your third pair. He's a right shot. If you can trade Tyson Berry straight up for Carson Soucy, and get a cheaper, more defensively responsible left shot option, save some money, sign Miller with the money, all of a sudden you have more money to allocate towards the forwards or getting another good veteran. And the right side of your defense is actually probably defensively a little bit stronger with Miller on that right side. And you've added Carson Soucy to the left side to potentially fill a hole left by Brett Kulak maybe leaving. So I still think there's a, I, I still think it would be wise for them to explore trading Tyson Berry just because where he sits on the depth chart and his cap hit, and the free agent market is not especially strong. So I think maybe a trade might need to be made still to properly fill that void. I think what Tyler's saying is that you always need a little bit of insurance on the back end. Unfortunately, you can't quite get that from our friends at Cornerstone, but you can get everything else. Auto residential, commercial, life insurance, anything you need, they got it. Cornerstoneins.ca. Citizens of the nation will get themselves a little discount. 
Uh, I wonder how active the Oilers are going to be in the trade market this off season. I know we're talking about free agency kicks off tomorrow, but like Tyler said, sometimes you can't sign away. Or you can't sign guys to fill all the holes you have in your roster. Speaking of trades, what was your thoughts on Gorgiev going to Colorado? Not just that, but also the contract he signed. Because if we're talking about Campbell, I know he's a free, uh, unrestricted free agent, a little bit older. But if he's at five five and Gore gives at what three four, hmm. they paid a pretty big gamble as well in Colorado on their goaltending. I think they just realized they don't need elite goaltending to win the Stanley Cup. Like Kemper had a nine oh two, like I said off the top. Like they know, like Franz O's actually played pretty well against the Oilers when he played, and I think he what he played two or three other games and had a good round like if they can just run with those two guys they probably think well why do we need to pay Kemper six million when we can just pay our combined goalies 5.4 together and then give all that money to Valeri Nachushkin yeah which <laughs> it's insane weird that was a big contract that they gave Nachushkin like was he not bought out a couple years ago yes, am I thinking yes. of the right guy yes. didn't he play in Europe for a year too I think he did at some point earlier with the stars yeah <laughs> And now he is an eight year deal. Big ticket. This is a reason ticket. why we should bring back Yakupov. I'm with Dan on this one now. What if Yakupov yeah, can be Nichushkin? Well, not only did so Nichushkin left for a year, came back to went to Europe, came back a different player, motivated player, a more polished player. Mm-hmm. Think of how good Yak would be after several seasons. True. Over in the KHL. He would be seven times better than Nichushkin. Wow. <laughs> With uh, that kind of progression, I don't see how you don't bring him back. But you're, I think you're right, just sorry, circling back to the abs, that it feels like they kind of sat there and were like, eh, good goaltending is good enough for us because we have a juggernaut up front. And then it almost feels like the Leafs saw that and was like, yes. And then they just went and got an average goalie. But the thing is... But paid more. Well, paid more, <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, like, average goaltending's only been good enough like once in recent memory to win the Stanley cup and the NHL is a weird copycat league. And I thought that the takeaway from watching the Colorado avalanche, when it all would be like, wow, you need to draft and develop homegrown superstars. You need to have a strong and mobile blue line, but it feels like every GM was just like, what if we made our goaltending worse? (laughs) (laughs) What? Well, that works for us a little bit. Wow. One name. I sorry, quickly just to go back to the, the guys in free agency. What about Brendan Smith? Ah. But as like a bottom pair in defenseman, like I don't, I don't know a ton about him. I just kind of look at him like some of the history, like Ken Holland drafted him in New York, uh, sorry, in Detroit. He's 33 years old. And he's like just a defensive defenseman now. I prefer Mark Pissick. But he's uh, Brendan Smith's a lefty. Oh, that's my, oh, but I don't want him to play every day. Like if you're bringing in that guy, he's got to be like a, your seventh D man. I think, think broberg has got to play. So he's not played 82 games in his career ever, actually. And the last two years he played 45 games and in 48 games. Hmm. So maybe he's willing to be that guy and he only made 800 K last year. So who knows? Just a name. There you go. Silly season, Liam. That's where you bring up all the names. You can bring up any name you want. Like Connor Hellebuck future oiler he just doesn't know it yet we're working on it it's a long game but that one but we'll get it done sometimes you need to remind yourself that rome was not built in a day mm-hmm. just like hellebuck was an oiler but it took more than a week of us screaming about it on podcasts that nobody in winnipeg probably listens to got it good uh i want to give a shout out to our friends at busters pizza.ca no ask the idiots today but keep sending questions and we'll bring that back on friday so busters pizza.ca there's a location near you i promise you tuesday by my count by my math by my urm chuck math mm-hmm. when your day is over you will have worked 40 percent of your work week i think that's right that is cause for celebration that in my is. opinion let's go to busters pizza grab yourself a pizza maybe a donair Maybe both. Mm. Maybe put your donair on the pizza. Mm. Maybe fold the pizza around your donair like a secondary pita. Wow. Whatever you do with it is your call. I'm just here to tell you to go. That's all. Got it? Good. Busterspizza.ca to get all of the location information and menus that they have available. A couple of quotes here from Duncan Keith, because as I mentioned earlier, he is in the process right now of doing his retirement ceremony at Rogers Place. Uh, A couple of things that stuck out to me as I'm going through Zach's quotes here. 
Um, it seemed like he enjoyed his time here. I, I know that's not really news, but when talking about Oilers fans, Keith thanked the fans for the experience saying it's incredibly special playing playoff hockey here at Edmonton and getting the chance to walk out from the dress room. You felt like a gladiator walking out onto the ice and it's an amazing special feeling. That is an interesting point from a guy who's done it a lot, right? I mean, I wouldn't expect him to say anything other than nice stuff about his time at Edmonton as he's retiring, but we do put on a fucking show in the playoffs at Rogers place. If you haven't been, you got to go. Do what Liam did. Spend all your money and go to one game because sometimes you have to. Still suffering. You have to. But well worth it. There, buddy. Uh, Keith named Tyson Berry, Kyle Torres, Darnell Nurse, Mike Smith, and Cody Cece as some of the guys who really made the year special for him. A lot of hot stoving with the media as well. Also loved playing in front of his son uh, a lot more this year than he's had a chance to in the past. That was the reason that he did make the trade. So now that it's official, official, we talked about it a little bit on the Friday episode of ON Radio. Just kind of what's your final thoughts if you had, you know, the Hallmark card version to wrap up Duncan Keith's tenure with the Oilers. For me, I'll start it off. Still don't like the trade overly all that much. Um, I think the cost of acquisition too, it was too high. But once he was here, he was fine. He provided the Oilers with reasonable defensive efforts throughout the season. Um, there were some highlights, I think, of game two against the Calgary Flames. He had a goal to assist in that game. That was probably the closest to Duncan Keith that everybody remembers that we got in his time here. And I thought he was solid. I thought he was fine. Obviously, we won't learn or hear about the lessons that he gave <sighs> to a guy like Evan Bouchard. But why are you grunting over there? What was that? Uh, just sighing that we'll never hear those stories and those lessons. Maybe he'll, Evan Bouchard will write a buck when he turns 35 next uh, week and retires. <laughs> Are we pretending that our media isn't going to be romanticizing everything that Duncan Keith taught Evan Bouchard? Of course, they, of course they will. They're already doing it. Yes. They're already doing it, baby. I, just, I don't know if I said that like, on... Sorry, go ahead, Dan. I was just going to say, just like Sean Horkoff was taught everything he knows and Jared Stoll was taught everything he knows by Adam Oates in that one year that we had him. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I said that on, on said this on ONR Real Life, but next year, the Oilers will go on another run and they'll look great or they'll get off to a hot start in the season and Bouchard will have like 13 goals in 25 games or some crazy shit. And it'll be like, you know, the lessons and Duncan Keith's fingerprints are all over this. And it'll be like, well, okay. I'll believe it when Evan Bouchard starts slashing people on the back of the calves was laying on the ground. <laughs> and that's when I'll believe. That Duncan will be Keith the lessons the that I want to see. <laughs> like Evan Bouchard, he needs a little bit of that fire. And if there's one thing to pick up from Duncan Keith, it is you hacking away at people's ankles when no one's looking. Can you imagine Bouchard? Oh, Actually, exactly. you're right. I will believe it. If Bouchard is like the meanest mother effer in the league next year, I'll be like, yep, that, that one's on Duncan. Yeah, that'll be what it does. It can't happen. He's the dad of the league. So what's your hallmark version of uh, the Duncan Keith time here? I, I thought he was fine. He wasn't great. He wasn't the Duncan Keith that was winning Conn Smythe trophy or Norris trophies, but he was fine. He was solid. Um, and having him, having him gone, the others have to replace just under 20 minutes of ice time a night. And I know people are going to say, Oh, well, Duncan Keith wasn't that good. Well, we'll see what they do to fill that time. And we'll see if fine was better than maybe we thought it was at the time. Liam? I think it's fair to say better than expected, right? Like the, it was, I almost felt like it was a bit of a nightmare when he was coming at first, just you always saw all those like advanced stats where everything was red. I don't know what any of them mean, but <laughs> red is never good. <laughs> and then, True. These are facts. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like you got him in the playoffs while it's done on this can barely put on his skates properly. I'm sure. And like, is suffering and Keith stepped up and played some extra minutes and played well enough for the others to get to the Western conference finals. And yeah. I think at the end of the day, like obviously when the trade happened, we were all like, why was no money retained? But now to look back at it, it was, I think you just got to see it as a success and be, I guess, thankful in a way that Keith was here for the year to help this team do what they did. And I, I think in the long run, having this run with Keith, is just going to help the team get forward and move ahead. And even the stuff he says about walking out in the playoffs and stuff, like I'm sure Keith knows quite a lot of people who are free agents too. Like you don't think that's going to help the others in some way. Like maybe someone calls him and says like, wow, that playoff experience was, that was nuts, you know, and yeah. that stuff's going to benefit the team. Tyler. 
Yeah, I think uh, there's obviously, you know, a lot of differing opinions on Keith. I'm with you, Bag Milk, in the sense that, you know, it was a good year for Keith. I'm I'm in a way happy they brought him in, but I still think they didn't win that trade. Um, they That could have been a slam dunk home run of a win for the Oilers, and it wasn't. It was just a solid deal, I guess, in hindsight. Um, if Keith didn't retire, it had the potential to be a bad deal. But, you know, knowing what we know now, I'm, I'm at the end of the day, probably happy they made that deal. Um, and yeah, he'll be remembered as a good veteran. And for the people who are like, oh, thank God he retired. Um, it is a sizable hole for them to fill still, right? Like he ate important minutes and he wasn't exactly great in those minutes, but he ate the minutes nonetheless. So you need to find a way to replace that. Dan? For me, I think that, yeah, there, there's there's stuff with for Duncan Keith that I think made it so that this final season was never going to be, you know, up to expectations, whether it was the cost of transaction, it's the, the dumpster fire that is the Blackhawks organization and everything that they've gone through in the last calendar year. And he's had his name attached to it the whole way through. It just wasn't going to be great. So I think it was as good as it could be expected. And yeah, I, like you guys said, you know, if, if Evan Bouchard comes out a new man this year and, and really changes his style of game, then maybe we, we have that, but otherwise, yeah, it was a, it was a good deal because he retired in the middle of it. So that's, to me, that's not a great thing to kind of punctuate it, but that is what it is. Reflecting on his time in Edmonton, Keith said the decision to leave Chicago was one of the best choices to make with the emphasis on being closer to his son, Colton, and playing in front of him more. He also said, or and I quote, I wanted to come to a team that gave us a chance and an opportunity to win. I know we came up short, but we had a hell of a run. We learned a lot, and I got the... I got the Oilers organization forever indebted and grateful for the opportunities you guys gave me to come here and play in front of my family, my son and my nephews, Gavin and Parker. They're here today. My nieces, Everly and Mia. So he just seemed like really grateful to have the opportunity to play in front of his family. When you get to the latter stages of your career, that makes sense to me. So to Duncan Keith, we say fare thee well, sir. You were here for a short time, but we had a good time. And all the best. You made like a hundred million dollars in your career. You're going to do fine. <laughs> You're going to do great. Enjoy the retirement, sir. And the 11 a.m. bottles of sangria. If you choose, that'd be my choice. doesn't have to be your choice. That's how I retire though. Maintaining a solid five out of 10. For the rest for of your days. <laughs> for decades. For decades. Uh, just before we get to the Twig and Berries hot and cold performers. So start thinking ahead, boys. The hot and cold performance today that I'm going to throw at you, your favorite and least favorite free agent signings with the Oilers over the years. So think about that as we're getting to the hot and cold performers. But I want to touch on a couple of UFAs that are going to be hit in the market or could be hit in the market as of tomorrow. Gino Malkin out of Pittsburgh. That one's going to be weird seeing him play for anyone else. He's going to be one of those players where you see him in like, I think of when Mike Madonna went to Detroit. You know what I mean? It's just going to be weird not seeing him as a penguin. So if I'm reading all the varying reports about this correctly, basically the penguins were pretty firm in like, we're giving you a three year deal. I think it was $6 million and Malkin got upset that, you know, Latang was kind of taken care of first and kind of rightfully so. Um, Malkin upset that he wasn't being given a longer term deal. And then last night, the night before that, somewhere late in the process, the Penguins said, we're willing to put a fourth year on the table here. We're willing to give you that fourth year you want. And by that point, it sounds like Malkin was just upset, hurt that it took that long. And, and the process was sort of as painful as it was. So Malkin said, I, I'm, I'm going to see what my other options are. I actually still think the most likely scenario here is that he comes back to Pittsburgh. I think he'll go sniff around, hear about a bunch of deals that maybe aren't quite as appetizing as he thought they'd be. And he'll go, nah, my heart's in Pittsburgh. I'm running it back with Sid and the gang. Um, but we'll Sometimes see. Sometimes you're just more comfortable with the devil, you know, also. Exactly. If, and if the opportunity is similar somewhere else, but he's comfortable in Pittsburgh, I could 100% see him back there. Oh, he's a Washington capital by the end of the summer. Book it right that now. Would be and Alex amazing. Ovechkin just tearing it up against his old friends. And then and then you see what happens in the offseason. I, I could see him not even securing the bag and just going to, like, like I think it was Frank that said it, you know, like just testing to see or the gra how the grass is elsewhere, you know, and and uh, see what it's like for a year. 
Liam, what's your take on Malkin? I think it would just be weird, wouldn't it? Like we said, to see him in a different jersey, but I think he is gone. Like I, I even the Raquel thing yesterday too. Like it's like okay, so you got Raquel done as well, but you still didn't get Malkin done. Like this seems odd the way things have kind of played out. And you know, Sidney Crosby didn't he say he's like we just want the band together the whole time, and they couldn't do it. Like I it just seems like it's ended to me. And Washington seems like the option. I think that would be cool actually to see him go there. Almost like a, like a a sense of what I can beat. I can beat Pittsburgh and I'm going to do it with their biggest rivals. Yeah. I, I'm not too. willing. I'm not going to say that the, it, he's totally out of the picture in Pittsburgh. They still have $10 million in cap space. What even, kind of uh, Pringles are you enjoying there, Tyler? Uh, barbecue. Thank you. Oh, Did nice. you hear me chewing? Yeah. I kind of turned my mic away. No, I was just looking at you enjoying them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're delicious. I've almost finished the whole can during the show. I bet. Uh, anyway, but even with Raquel market. signed, they have $10 million, right? They pro they might not sign Evan Rodriguez actually. So like you can give, six and a half million dollars comfortably to Malkin and still add probably another forward on top of that. So I, I if I had to bet, I would bet on Malkin being back in Pittsburgh. I, I don't think it's done because of the money. I just think it's done because it's not done right now. I think that's just my thing about it. We'll see. Another guy that could be done and looking for a New Jersey, Johnny Gaudreau. Again, Frank Saravalli. And I quote, my sense is the flames have put an offer on the table for Johnny Gaudreau north of $10 million by eight years. This would make him not only the highest paid player in Calgary franchise history, but among the richest NHLers in general. 10 by eight for Johnny Gaudreau is a steep ticket. Mm -hmm. Do it. (laughs) Oh, I want them to do it. Don't get me wrong. Like you absolutely do it. What's or don't do it and tear it all down. Like I think both options are amazing. <laughs> What's your guys take on Johnny? I think he's gone. I Calgary can offer him an eighth year, which means Calgary can offer him more money than anyone. Right. Eight by 10 is $80 million. If you were to take $80 million, hang on. Hang on. Uh, yep, you, that's correct. Go ahead. Yep. Yep. Just check. If you out. divide 80 million by seven years, which is what every other team can offer him. Also, it's what the Flames can offer him if he doesn't sign the eight year deal by tonight at midnight. That's 11.4 million a season. I don't think another team's offering him 11.4 million over seven years. It's great math by me. Did it all in my head. Swear to God. <laughs> I saw it. Yeah. So I, where, I, the, where are some potential destinations for him? I saw Islanders might make a push, Philly might make a push. New Jersey, possibly. Those are the three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you saw Philly with something that I I at least read as telling today when they bought out Oscar Lindblom. I think they might push to move James Van Riemsdyk and get enough money. But my point is, if he's not taking the eight-year deal from Calgary, this isn't about money. And if it's not about money, he's gone. So I think he's gone. I I agree with you completely. And I think the delay in the announcement to this point, I think tells you everything you need to know. To me, you're not you're not dragging it out this far. The flames aren't dragging out their offers this far if if he's not coming back, because it's not a good look for you as a as a you know, being the franchise player to take as long as he has to to think about it and even pause on being a part of that team. But the, the back end of this, that's the crazier part to me is that the rumblings of the flames, just tearing it apart. If he doesn't end up signing there or Gaudreau leaves and they throw a bunch of money at a Vander Kane, perhaps <laughs> the same money. But if they want to go seven by seven with Kane, like be my guest. Yeah. Oh yeah. That'd be so weird. Especially I, offered to, I offered it to Flames fans on like a month ago and they were upset at me, but now it might be their only option. No, imagine well, and th- there Kachuk. could also be just a domino effect. If Gaudreau leaves, what does that mean for Kachuk? There's going to be an interesting summer down in Calgary. Or if they sign Gaudreau for that much smoke, is that the end of Kachuk? Yeah. Or does he just look at it and be like, you better fucking match me or I'm out of here. Yeah. Well, so Frank actually had a pretty interesting quote on uh, on the DFO rundown where he kind of said it's his belief that if the Flames don't get Goudreau, Kachuk might not be all that interested in signing their long term either. And it may actually kickstart a rebuild for the Calgary Flames, which wow. would mean Connor McDavid single handedly sent the Flames into a rebuild. Actually, Goudreau did. That's a lie. <laughs> Tyler, get your buttons ready. Oh, no. Time to wrap it up real quick with the hot and cold performers for our friends at Twig and Berries. Go to twigandberries.ca. Use the promo code NATION15. Get a little discount off your order. If you're in St. Albert, head on out Tyler's way. 
You might even see them there modeling some nutsack undies, not mm. only because they look good, because they feel good. And when Tyler looks good, he feels good. Figaberries.ca. Mm-hmm. All right. So you had a little bit of time to think about it, boys. We're sticking to the Oilers and free agency. Tomorrow is the start of free agency. We're starting off with our veggies. Nation Dan, what is your least favorite Oilers free agent signings in recent memory or just as far back as you want to go, really? We'll see what gets checked off the board here. Free agent signings. Um, well, I mean, I he was actually at the time, I mentioned him earlier, was one of my favorite signings was Nikolai Happy Poulin. I really thought that that was going to go a lot different than it did. Um, recent signings. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I'd say Nikolai Happy Poulin. I mean, recently, like the Hyman signing was unreal and it was funny to me because it was... Uh, it was good. And then also a bad one was that Nylander debacle a couple of few years ago where he signed with us in yeah, principle Michael, and then at the Michael last Nylander, minute yeah. went and signed with the Capitals. And that, I mean, that of course threw our franchise into a tailspin that we've never recovered from, but you know, it was a transaction that was annoying nonetheless. Tyler, in your opinion, what has been the worst Oilers free agent signing in recent memory for our friends at Tokyo Bears? I will go with, hmm, I'll say Benoit Pouliot for the Edmonton Oilers. Um, it was a very long term deal like that. The fact that they gave him, you know, the the fifth year and that's something they've rarely ever done as an organization in the cap era. And then it just fizzled out so quick and we had to sit there and stomach the buyout for as long as we did. Like uh, that was uh, that was an ugly one. So I'm going to go ahead and say the Benoit Pouliot contract is my uh, cold former of the week. We have been hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray, run amok and flat out deceived. Liam, for Twig and Berries, what is the worst Oilers free agent signing contract you can remember? So this is this came to my head immediately and it's from the same year as Pouliot. I'm going to go with Mark Fain. That one kind of sucked. Four years, 3.25 million or something like that, I think it was. What, he played two full seasons with the Oilers and spent mm-hmm. the rest in the, the minors? I think one of my favorite Mark Fain moments, boys, was in the 2017 playoff run. We were having a nation party at the Pint, and the Black Aces were there in the background, and the Oilers just lost Game 7 against the fucking Anaheim Ducks. We are all upset in the bar. Lights go down, music comes up, and they're on the dance floor having a buggy. Mark Fade. Oh, death cold. How dare you dance in a moment like that? Uh, but maybe we should all dance in moments like that. I don't know. Who's yours, Bag Milk? Oh, there's a couple. The easy, I can't believe he's still on the board. Lucic. Seven by six. Yeah. That okay. was a big one. Although, to be very fair, and I will, because I'm a fair boy. That first year, Lucic here at Edmonton, he was pretty good. Mm-hmm. He was kind of the guy we wanted him to be in that mm-hmm. first year. Honorable mention, Eric Belanger. He wanted the third year because he believed in what was going on. Three by three for Boyd Gordon. Boyd Gordon, the commissioner. He could take faceoffs like a fucking champ, though. Ben Eager, there's another one. Yeah. So we got to ra- uh, flip the ledger. We got to wrap this up. Tyler's giving me the high sign. Mm-hmm. Liam, best free agent signing for the Oilers for our friends at Twig and Berries. I'm just going to go a little bit down the line here. Because I don't want to say someone from this year, but I'll just say when we signed Mike Smith to the one year deal, just kind of worked out well for three years and was part of the team that went to the Western Conference Finals. So I'll go with him. The big guy is smoking hot. Nation Dan, favorite Oilers free agent signing for our friends at Twig and Berries. I'm just, I've been racking my brain since, uh, or racking the websites or the internet to try and find all the free agent signings in the past. Um, I mentioned him for some reason during my negative one, but Zach Hyman obviously is a, has been a, a huge free agent signing for us. Um, and then like off the top of my head, it just feels like the Oilers just don't often sign guys as free agents that, that turn out to be all that in a bag of, I'm trying to think was, was, uh, Mike Pekka free agent signing or we, did we no, trade, 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 we did trade for him from the Islanders. See that? Like I'm, I'm at a loss except for recent stuff. And most of our recent stuff is negative, but I'll say Zach Hyman. Tyler. He's a hot guy. Uh, my favorite one. I can't believe I'm doing this to you bag milk, but nude, right? We can agree on this. I think 
it, it was a free agent signing because he was, was scheduled to go to UFA and it, it it's going to keep him likely as an oiler for his whole career, which I think is neat. There you go. So, uh, yeah, Nuge. Uh, what button do I want to hit? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is why I'm hot. I'm hot because I'm flat. You ain't because you not. Uh, I'll say the first Tyson Berry. UFA contract that he signed here. That was a damn good one. He went and led the league as a, with points as a defenseman. That was a pretty damn good one. Turned that into a three-year deal for himself. I will also say a guy that we all questioned last year and in his first year with the Edmonton Oilers, not only does he look good, he played pretty damn good as well. Cody CC. Put some respect on my love. name. And there you go. Oilers Nation Radio in the books. Liam and Tyler have a hard out. So I want to say thank you to DoorDash, Oodle Noodle, Cornerstone Insurance, Buster's Pizza, and Twig and Bears for making it all possible. And most importantly, you for welcoming us into your ear holes on a Tuesday afternoon. Enjoy free agency, everybody. Shout out Johnny Gaudreau. Thanks for listening to Oilers Nation Radio, delivered by DoorDash. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and give us a follow on Twitter and Instagram. 